It's the Benz Brunani woman is Baby boys, baby girls, you need to hear this Baby sit down, sit down, receive this realness Make sure your cup's ready for the tea we are go sippy yo Hard time scrolling for your long shorts You might learn something you never know Collect you find, and she's one of a kind Don't say you mind, say you mind Ooh, baby, baby, I'm back up in this bitch. What? Hey, hey. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another week of SYM, officially known as Say Your Mind, unofficially known as What What. That is right. Suck your mum. So I'm Kalechi. Kalechi Okafor, if this is your first episode listening, welcome. I mean, I don't know why you're doing that, but okay, welcome. And to all my regulars, all my all my OGs. Hey. So um, wow, this week there's been a lot, like lots of stuff happening. I was saying to my therapist that like, wow, I just feel so busy, busy in life and just busy inside. Um, but there's there's lots of things to get through. So I'm going to stay on form and, and you know, go with my notes because my notes are where everything is. So, hmm. Yeah, let's start with, let's start with the tarot. Let's start with the tarot and then we'll go into the other bits. I hope you enjoyed having Kevin, Kevin here last week. I'm sure it seems like so many people did like, honestly, that was like one of my, if no, that was my favorite episode. NGL, not going to lie. Like that was my favorite episode. Like Kevin is truly inspirational. I proper love him off. And I'm so glad that he was able to bring that knowledge that he brought to the show um yeah like he's he's just such a g um yeah so let's let's get started so the cards that i pulled for this week uh from the black angel cards is uh the joker in case there you go for you to see those who are watching on youtube so i pulled the joker card and you just see someone laughing um with tears coming out of their eyes and it's just a you know vibrant card it's just really really nice oranges and purples and blues and blacks it's just really nice so what it says about the joker is this it says the joker your lively nature reveals true joy on your waking path liveliness on your sleeping path sadness so joker brings humor to the mundane and the extraordinary joker plays and turns things upside down inside out to shed new light on things that are familiar the joker that is brought through you joker can be felt at the Let's start that again. The joy that is brought through you, Joker, can be felt as true wisdom. Your laughter is potent and can bring us to tears. You use humor and laughter as a way to bring the physical body into the experience of revival. You get the blood pumping. Your humor is necessary to help us release the toxicity built up inside when we suppress the life that is in us. Your laughter produces a contagious healing effect that can help us get through the rigors of life. When you are in the waking path, your liveliness comes from a genuine love of life. Some people feel you can take things too lightly. Your humor is not valued at times when people expect you to be serious. You know that not being able to laugh at oneself can lead to an extended stay in the deep uh, sea of emotions. Knowing this is key to your ability to successfully use humor. People catch themselves laughing around you, but they don't always know the reason. However, when you get downright silly, people tend to shut down on you. You notice this shutdown because you feel a little awkward at times yourself. Folks can be uncomfortable with a release of laughter. The deep, vivacious sound that comes from the belly can appear improper to some, but in fact, those sounds are healing. You may not be aware that as a joker, you have an incredible healing gift. Humor is your way through the revival process. Your life your lightheartedness is exactly what we need in our experiences of life's disappointments on the sleeping path perhaps you are taking things a bit too lightly joker you use your humor to hide your emotions watch to see if you are distracting attention away from your fear or pain um, that you or others are experiencing in the moment you are so used to laughing things away that you might be on autopilot 
Hiding your sadness or emotions can indicate you are on the sleeping path. You can be on this sleeping path of sadness for years, thinking you're being lively when in fact you are numb. Slow down your pace by holding back some of your humour. Speak less or speak a bit slower. Bring your attention inward in silent moments instead of always filling the space with your humour. This awareness could lead you to discover some things that need to be unearthed in your heart. The fear may, the fear may increase as you decrease the laughter, but over time, a, car, a feeling of calm will eventually surface to replace the anxiety covered by laughter and your laughter will return in an authentic way. Also, in the calm, you will see that your laughter is more than a coping skill. Rather, it is a pulsating lift to our spirits. Recognize your place among the healers and honor your medicine of joy. You are more than entertainment. Well, drag the fuck out of me, why don't you? Thanks, send you Earthlin Manuel for, for that. God, wow, wow. I think that's so... Um, I think it's so beautiful. I know so many people who I would say um, they're the Joker. I mean, we all have aspects of each um, of these Black Angel cards within us. But the Joker especially, I think that it speaks a lot to me as well. I know that the first card I ever pulled from this deck was the Mother Wit card, which is um, similar, but it, done, it does talk. The Mother Wit card talk, talks about um, uh, sarcasm as well. So it's a bit more stingy I would say yeah it's it's a bit more prickly that one and I think that that describes me or describes me at the moment I find myself but this card was really really interesting because I think that especially with the things that I've gone through recently and I know that just generally collectively we were carrying a lot at the moment I mean we've got Do we've got Donald Trump as president we've got Teresa Pussyclart as prime minister like there's just a general feeling of foreboding for a lot of people so we want want to just be lighthearted and so we do that by joking 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 so we're almost in hysterics as a way of avoiding um the things that we should address um so that yeah that definitely speaks a lot to me I was speaking with my therapist about it um the, the other day when I had my session and she was saying you know you know, when I said to her that everything's been so busy, busy around me, busy inside me, just busy in my head. And she was just like, so when are you taking time to just be? And I think it's so easy to be like, oh, you know, I'm going to get to it. It's just because I'm so busy because I'm so busy. But you, you know that that's not really it. You know, that's not really it, baby boys and baby girls and baby non-binaries. You know, that's not it. You're avoiding the work that you need to do. You're avoiding the sadness that you need to face. It might not even be a sadness that's um, anything that's happened recently, but just the residual sadness that's just sitting there that you need to address. And you're just like, oh, I'm going to do other things. And everyone knows that I love to bust a joke, which is why it's hilarious to me when little dry, crusty batty guys on the internet are talking about, oh, she's so angry. Most of the times I'm joking about, but I joke about as a way to divert conversation at times. I joke about as, um, you know, to make light of the world, this ridiculous world that we find ourselves in. But on the other hand, um, I make light of things because also I know that people might be uncomfortable knowing, especially if, if they're aware of the things that I've gone through. I, you, you, There's this just like desire to make them feel at ease. Um... And I was talking to my therapist about it, like I said, and we were discussing this whole idea of um, how I hadn't paid much attention to the things that I take on board about people. So we were saying that, um, well, I said to her, lots of people talk about, oh, well, you know, if even when people say rubbish things about you or mean things about you, maybe there's an element of truth to it. And I was talking about something that my mum has said to me and the things that she said to me over the years. And you know what Nigerian mums are like? They will just say something like this and to them it's whatever. But then you keep it in mind. Um, and not to say that all Nigerian mothers are like that, but, you know, mine especially is like that. And she said, no, no, you don't have to um, believe the things that people say about you that aren't nice. You don't have to believe it looking for an element of truth in it. If you think that you're a bad bitch, then you're a bad bitch. No one can come and tell you otherwise. No one should come and tell you about your negatives and then you take it on as rote. Like, oh yeah, they're definitely telling the truth. No, and even if they are, well, oh well. And I thought, wow, I really stand for this therapist because she's really given me different ways of looking at things. Because to her, she's just like, look, 
People will receive you at the level of living that they are at. They can only take you from where, what, from what they have experienced of themselves and they've experienced of life. So if someone's calling you, for instance, I don't know, obnoxious, like we know certain man was spewing before they had to see me on Grapevine TV. Um, suddenly they see you in person and they don't know how to behave. But even if they'd never seen you and they'd use that term, so, so... If you don't see yourself as obnoxious or you know that you have the you have the ability to be if you want to be, but you just generally are not that, then why are you taking it on board as, oh, there could be an element of truth in that? Fuck that. She didn't say this verbatim, but I'm just paraphrasing it and saying it in my language. But she was just like, fuck that. You tell yourself all of the great things about you because especially at this crucial moment in our lives, we need to know the great things about ourselves because there are so many things telling us otherwise. And that's what's important. So big up Emma, man. Like Emma, my therapist, is a real G out in these streets. Like, yas. So um, then I pulled the um, Rider Waite Smith uh, deck and the first card that came up was the Nine of Cups. Now, remember the past few weeks we've been really dealing with cups is like with disappointment and loss and things like that and then the nine of uh cups comes up which is a nice card it's a positive card we see a chubby man sitting with his arms crossed sitting in front of nine cups really looking really really happy and satisfied with himself yellow such a bright color reminds me of the sun card so this is prosperous this is good and he's got the red hat on his head for success and i think it's interesting that the red hat that's a sign of success is on his head because when in the yoruba kind of um spirituality belief system we say like you're already that's your destiny that remembers your higher self that remembers where your um what you were here to do and that chose your destiny before you came into this physical realm and so for the fact that the success is on the head it's saying to me that like this is a this is a higher this is a this is a higher frequency thing that you were destined for this greatness and now here you are so for the joker most especially yes you you know life is a bit uh, and you might be making jokes to avoid things but you've got to realize that great things are now here for you whether you're they're either here right now or they're like here very 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 soon like great things we're no longer dealing with the disappointment of the eight of cups or um like the five of cups or anything like that now we're here now we're here at the nine of cups where you know it's not ten but nine is is fantastic so we're at the nine of cups and nine, you reduce it down to three. The three is the magic number. Um, so that's a sign of change and success. And this is positive, you know, a positive change is taking place. And it's about m not just the um, emotional things that you're going to get, but also the material things that are on their way to you. And this is reinforced because the next card that came out with the, uh, the nine of cups was... Um, the seven of pentacles we've seen the seven of pentacles before so the seven of pentacles was the next card that came out and we see um, a person tending to a garden that has coins growing from it so you know like Theresa may was like i don't we don't have a magic mining tray little bitch but um yes so this is this person's basically their magic money tree so this is why i say that it's not just um emotional things that you know it's the, the success that's coming for you isn't just something that's going to fulfill you spiritually and fill your cup emotionally but it's also going to be a material it's material things that come in your way but in terms of the material um wealth and um the upswing that's coming your way it's also asking for patience and we spoke about this last week with kevin and when Kevin was on the show about patience, like tend to these things lovingly. And that means maybe setting the ground ready for the things that are coming your way, like because they're almost here, they're almost here. So you need to be emotionally prepared for them and you need to make sure that your surroundings are prepared for them as well. So it doesn't catch you off guard. And then you're dealing with imposter syndrome, feeling like you don't deserve it. So, so those of you who don't know, like I love listening to the Reed podcast. I love Kid Fury. He's like my, obviously I really, really like Crystal, but I just adore Kid Fury. And he was saying in his, the most recent episode of the Reed that he's been basically having thoughts about not being here. And, you know, there were people in the audience who were just like, but you're so successful. What do you mean? And we've heard of a lot of successful people recently taking their own lives. And it's to say to you that, Someone can look like they've got everything and inside they're still so, so sad and, and, and they don't 
not everyone wants to end their life, but they possibly just don't want this life. And that's why I think it's great that the card didn't just come up, you know, the, the nine of cups didn't just come up on its own. It came up with a card telling you to tend to yourself and to tend to the things around you. So when the things that you're praying for, that you're working for, when they arrive, they don't catch you so off guard and they don't overwhelm you so much that you start to believe that they're not even good enough and you're not good enough to have them or they're too good for you. You want to avoid that. And there's a card, um, when I look to the bottom of the deck, um, for the card that we're going to discuss in the extended content, it was the Ace of Pentacles that came out. So again, the Ace of Ke Pentacles really reinforcing this thing that you need to ground yourself. You need to ground yourself. Stop cracking jokes to avoid the shit that you need to get done. You need to ground yourself before all of your successes start like literally flinging themselves at your head. You need to be ready and it's about grounding. It's about finding a way to ground yourself, whether it's therapy, whether it's dancing, whether it's journaling, whether it's cooking, whether, wh whatever it is, find a w something that's personal to you, do it. And to give yourself that space within yourself that you can trust yourself. So when your successes start coming or whether it's a new relationship that you're looking for or whether it's a new job that you've prayed for that's on its way or whatever it is, when it arrives, you're not just like, oh, I'm not sure that I deserve it. Um, maybe this isn't for me. And that's a self drag. I'm not even just talking out because you ha you also have to realize that when these cards come up or when I'm pulling cards as well, it's also um, picking up on my energy. So I feel like that's also a self drag where it's just like a bitch, get ready, like get ready because when the things them come, like don't, don't now start doing, I don't think this is, I don't think I'm, I'm good enough for this. Shut, 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 shut your mouth there and go and go and go and go and prepare yourself, Jerry. So that was for me, not for you guys. I wouldn't be so harsh. So yeah, those are the cards. Start preparing yourself. Start tending to yourself lovingly, not impatiently. Start tending to yourself lovingly. Get your finances in order. Just, just because something great is coming your way does not mean that you now have to come and spend like someone that doesn't have common sense. Make sure that you've got things in place because... Even when the successes come, there might be a moment, um, there might be a period where you don't get that money or you don't get those things straight away. If it's a new relationship, or you, the, all of the fun, like, oh, let's take Insta pics or let's go on holiday together. The, all of that stuff isn't going to come straight away. So prepare everything beforehand. Get yourself ready beforehand is all I got to say to you. So all my jokers out there that that resonates with maybe for this week let's not laugh so much and um, let's not you know be so inclined to make people laugh let's not be so inclined to make light of every situation to avoid the things that we need to feel and probably the very very real conversation that we conversations that we need to have with ourselves and with other people so that's the tarot for this week and we'll talk about the ace of pentacles in the extended version um in the extended content as well so also shout out to all my patrons i've looked at all of your feedback about the day to have the live show looks like people are leaning more towards saturday just waiting for confirmation from the venue and um yeah then then we're, we're we'll be good to go and it looks like it'll be a saturday and i'm really really looking forward to seeing as many of you at the live show as possible yeah but big up my patrons big up everyone who um listens to this podcast every week like i don't shout you guys out enough i don't feel like you're honestly such g's like two slaps on your chest everybody right now thank you i, I appreciate that anyway let's move swiftly on then to share your magnificence so share your magnificence this week. Um, I've got quite a lot to get through. So first, big up my baby girl, Chimmy Lawson, also known as the Pinker Print on um, Instagram. Love just the way that she curates her page. It's so funny. It's so wonderful. So she's got a book called um, The Little Pink Book that she sent to me where it's um, a collection of like Instagram captions and thoughts about them. And it's just really, really interesting deconstructing social media, the things that we post, why we post them and just having that sort of reality check. I should have brought the uh, little pink book with me for you to see, but big up yourself, Chimmy Lawson. Love you dearly. I love the book. I'm just cracking up when I'm reading certain captions. It's wonderful. And I, I want for all of you to have it as well. So I'll try and find it. Well, get you guys a link so you can also get, get laughing. 
Um, also, I'm reading How to Love a Jamaican. So this was sent to me by the publishers, Pan Macmillan um, or Picador, whichever one they want to call themselves. Pan Macmillan. They, uh, so this was sent to me, um, one of their copies, their proof copies, um, How to Love a Jamaican. And it's by Alexia Arthurs. It's a series of short stories. Just showing that on the camera. It's a series of short stories. And I've got to tell you, I started reading uh, the book uh, I want to say 3 a.m. this morning and I'm almost done. Like I'm almost done. I've only got so, so much left. Like I'm halfway through. I think I'll finish it by tonight. Um, it's so good. Like so fucking hell is so good. I'm not even, I'm not even Jamaican, you know, I'm not even, I'm not even a, a Jamaican, but I, I really like it. Um, no, honestly, it's fantastic. It's beautifully written. Like Alexia Arthur and um, Arthur's has, a brilliant way with words where I just started reading and it was so easy to fall into. Like Nayira, um, Nayira Wahid talks about the fact that books are like passports, that you can go so many places with them and never leave where you are. And with Alexia Arthurs in this book, I go to so many places with her. Like other books have been sent to me that I haven't quite got round to reading, but this one I just launched in straight away because the title is also captivating. But be prepared that when you're on the tube reading it, people will be like, oh, Wow, sis must be struggling, really looking for a manual on how to love a Jamaican. Because sis, that is an extreme sport. That is an extreme sport. But um, no, it's it's truly wonderful. It's very incredibly well written. It's so nuanced. Um, I've I've put, picked up a section that I wanted to uh, read out briefly. There's the very first story. Uh, is called Light Skinned Girls and Kelly Rowlands. I won't read you anything from that part. Because you need to read that bit. It's, it's, I read it and I just thought, whoa. So many things happen in um, the kind of exploration of this friendship between two women, two black women, and um, while they're at college that I can totally, totally relate to it. All of the titles are funny. Um, and they relate really, really well to obviously the mini stories that they're about. But the bit I wanted to read to you went like, just to give you an idea of her writing goes like this. Um, she mothered the girls without a man and took in sewing because it was all she could do beautifully. She was a dark skinned, dry headed girl and not even the kind of dark skin that shone so everybody, even those who lightened their skin had to admit that that shade of brown was something to look at. Her mother used to suck on scotch bonnet peppers when she was pregnant. When the child came out from between her mother's legs and everybody saw she took her father's dark colouring, the name Pepper stuck. But they used to call her Blackie or Dryhead when she was in school. And no one had to tell her that she wasn't the kind of woman anybody looked at more than once. Maybe that's why she lay down for the first man who paid her any mind, even though he was a married man with four children and only had three good teeth in his mouth. When the wife heard that her husband got some young girl pregnant, she turned up at Pepper's house with a machete in her hand. Not because she was expecting to cut Pepper, since the machete was too dull, but because she wanted to look tough. That's from one of the stories called Slack. Oh, just that description in itself, it, it, it's a very, it gives me a very Toni Morrison vibe where Toni Morrison will describe something to you and she'll throw in things that you think are not relevant, but they add so much shape and taste and texture to the, the story that you're just like, whoa, I, I see them. I see Peppa. I see her mum and I see the two girls that she gave um, birth to later on. Like the short stories are wonderful and I can't wait to get through the other stories that are in here. Um, she has, uh, in the book, she has stories that are focused, uh, that are based in Jamaica. She has stories that are based in New York and um, various places, but it's individuals that aren't linked. It's, oh, it's so gorgeous. I remember talking a while back about how much I loved Junio Diaz. And then I was disappointed when I heard about the sex, sex, uh, sexual assault allegations and things like that. Um, really disappointed in him and talking about how his writing leaves it's like I can taste the places that he's describing and this is what I feel about Alexia Arthur's book where I feel like I can taste what she's describing it's truly truly wonderful so it's not out yet because <laughs> you know gal <laughs> gal like me is really out here just getting books before the time you get me ah sorry sorry for that outburst 
<laughs> yeah, so this comes out in America July 24th Then it comes out in the UK a month later So I think you can pre-order it on Amazon So you guys better get to, call, um, get to it It's called How to Love a Jamaican Let's support black women Give black women our coins Especially black women that know how to write the fuck out of a book So that's that um, Moving on Let's move it on Let's move it on um, I want to big up um, the actor from ESN podcast, as well as David Ajibade, who's also known as Kinetic Fitness, as well as Joshua, who's uh, also known as Fitness V Work. Why am I picking up these random men? Why why these random black men? There are so many more like dubs, like uh, my babes, Michael, who listens to the show. Um, obviously Richie, obviously Kevin, like so, so many black men. I'm, in, I'm even nervous now because I know I've missed out other black men but the reason i'm mentioning these um three black men specifically the actor um david and joshua is because during the you know going through everything with the miscarriage and everything else so many people have felt awkward rightly so like i understand like felt awkward about messaging and things like that especially men um but these black men took it really upon themselves to kind of just checking on check in on me randomly like david we haven't, I don't think we've even met. I just, we, we chat a lot on the net and he sends me abuse and I send him abuse right back. Um, Joshua, before I even ever met Joshua, I remember when I was opening the studio and he donated a hefty amount of money to the opening of the Peckham Kolechnikov studio. And I was astounded because I thought this guy doesn't know me. We've never met yet. I'm doing something. He sees me. He really sees me and he's supporting me. As for the actor, um, he saw a post by um, Shaka Bars or whatever. I don't know how to ever pronounce his name. Shaka Bars? Shaka Bars. He saw a post by him about miscarriage and he sent it to me private, um, via private message. It was really, really sweet. It was really sweet. And I was really taken aback because tenderness from black men is so beautiful caring from black men is so beautiful and to me that is my um that is my perception of black love my baby girl leona nicole black who's a tarot therapist a phd um person like researcher she you know she's about to get her phd can't wait um leona nicole black was talking about the fact that she feels that we limit the conversation about black love um and we shouldn't we limit it to romantic relationships intimate you know romantic relationships usually like monogamous ones and um we talk about black love black love black love as if it can only be romantic while missing out and totally alienating the black love that comes from friendships and she was saying leona was saying that why don't we look at the ways in which we can build on black love because any great relationship is based on friendship is is, is based on trust respect you know empathy those kind of things there so because of the way that white supremacist patriarchy has refracted um, our relationships with each other, just generally speaking, as constructs, man, woman, black woman, black man, um, we have a lot of work to do in rebuilding. And rebuilding means rebuilding trust and things like that. And I think that, honestly... These men, especially this week, just looking at them and how supportive that they've been of me, two that I haven't even ever met, how supportive they've been of me at such a tender time. Like David just WhatsApp me and he was just like, just checking on you, letting you know that I'm here if you need to speak. Like weeks after the fact, you know, he messaged me at the time, but he's still checking up on me. And, you know, same with Joshua, just still just, are you okay? Are you all right? Those things matter to me. And for me, in those moments, I just thought these are the kind of guys that I would always ride for. But case in point, I'm not a ride or die chick. I just want to let everybody know that again, because when you ride, you do surely die. But what I'm saying is that I will, I will ride and support these men because in the sad, in my sad moments, Knowing that they exist really, really brightens my, really brightens my life, really brightens my mood. Everyone knows that I love black women for, for days on end and I love black men, but we, 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 we be arguing, we, we be arguing. So to know that there are black men who see me, they see the things that I say, they hear the things that I say, and I still like, oh, hey, baby girl, just making sure that you're okay. That 
means the world to me. So they're my magnificent people um, amongst the others, you know, Chimmy and um, Alexia, my magnificent people, the actor, David and Joshua, like you are so, so incredible and keep checking on us. We'll keep checking on you. I appreciate you greatly. So thank you guys. Two slaps on your chest. Yes. So um, also my last share your magnificence goes out to the secret lives of Baba Segi's wives. I went to go and watch it at the Arcola Theatre on Wednesday where I met Jeanette and her partner Isaac, who gave me lots and lots of jokes. Um, it's really nice to meet people who listen to the podcast and who support me in the ways that people do. It, it means the world. Even on my way here, when TFL was trying to fuck me up the ass, um, but I made it to the studio finally. I bumped into um, a lady that um, a lady that told me that she listens to the show as well, and it, it's really nice to just know that people are out here. They love it. They're listening, and and in, in, I mean, even Bella Niger, Bella Niger mentioned the podcast in like top ten or ten top ten podcasts to listen to featuring Nigerians or by Nigerians, and I was just like, right, a baby girl, a baby girl, really in, on Bella Niger, and I didn't have to drop no wedding and go in and you know take myself into debt. Wow. Amazing. So thank you, Bella Niger. I really appreciate that. But back to Baba Segi's wives. Fucking phenomenal. I already love the fuck out of Lola Shonayin, who wrote, um, who wrote the book, The Secret Lives of Baba Segi's Wives. But then to go and see it on stage was just incredible. It was so funny. It was truly wonderful. And it was wonderful to see so many black people in the audience as well. But I was a bit annoyed by the fact that there was a row at the front that was just empty. So black people of the African diaspora, you know, just everyone of the African diaspora, just everyone else who wants to come along anyway, I'm not sure that you'll get everything, but it's beautiful. It's theatre. We don't have to get everything. It doesn't have to be our exact lived experience. That's why we go there to go and learn more. You can go and watch this too. The tickets aren't um, expensive. Go through, book it on the Arcola website. I'll add a link to the caption if you want me to. I, I'm going back another two times, definitely. I'm definitely going on Wednesday, 27th of June to go and watch it again. So if you man are about, book your ticket for that day and I'll see you there. Like as many of us as possible. Let's support this because it meant, it means so much to me that a book that I love so much is on stage and that my baby girls are in it, especially my baby girl, Diana Yekini. We went to Brit School of Performing Arts together. She was in theatre. I was in musical theatre. And just watching how we've both grown over the years is wonderful. So to see her in that play, just killing it is incredible. Um, just all the other actresses that are in it, all the other actors that are in it, um, Tanya, Tanya Nwachuku is in it as well. She, uh, brilliant. She plays Segi, Baba Segi's daughter, um, obviously. Um, yeah, so if you're going to be about Wednesday, 27th of June, I'm going to be watching it on that day. If you want to avoid me because you hate my guts, book another day. So yeah, I hope that I see more people there. But Baba Segi's wives, um, Secret Lives of Baba Segi's Wives is wonderful. Truly, truly wonderful. And I'm so happy that more black people plays more more Africanness is being put on at the theatres for and it's got a seven week run. We re, we never get a seven week run. So that's wonderful. Go check it out. Anyway. Anyway. Moving on. Moving it on. Let's go to So You Mad. So the first mad person for this week is Anna Turley. She's an MP for Red Car, which is an area in the UK, if you don't, if for my non-UK listeners. Um, Red Car, this area, this is the MP for that area. Kind of like how you have governors for your kind of areas and things like that. Anyway... Um, she decided that she was going to be very, very stupid and ask Cancer Research UK some really dumb as fuck questions. So Cancer Research UK put up a, um, a video. They tweeted a video that they'd made like an animation and they added the tweet, cervical screening or the smear test is relevant for everyone aged 25 to 64 with a cervix. Watch our animation to find out how and find out what to expect when you go for your screening. Hashtag cervical screening awareness week. Your girl, Anna, 
decides to tweet at Cancer Research UK, instead of doing the job that she needs to be doing for her fucking constituents, she decides to tweet at Cancer Research UK and she says the following. Hi, Cancer Research UK. Why have you used the term everyone with a cervix in this tweet, please? So... I'm just really confused as to what Anna is confused about. You know, like, what, she's not old. Like, and she looks to me to be like middle-aged white woman. And it's actually quite sad that she's a labor. I think she's a labor MP. I don't know. Anyway, um, she looks rather young. So she shouldn't be confused i understand when older people are confused like oh i don't know all the terms that you people are using these days or in my day you was just a man and a woman now now we've got all of these people wanting to be different things i mean i'm not i don't mind i'll take anybody as they are i'm a sort of the earth sort of person but you're not one of them people there so what are you confused about they said everyone with a cervix so they're trying to be as inclusive as possible because they know that not everybody with a cervix identifies as a woman you prick that's why they're not saying um women come and get your smear test they're saying everybody with a cervix so you know that fam if you've got a cervix go in and you're between the age of uh, ages of 25 to 64 you need to go and get your your smear test like what is so confusing about this she goes further on to say um I just think that it's a bit, um, I, it's, it's a bit um, an, annoying why they're using that term because it's like nobody wants to use the term woman anymore. Bitch, it's not that deep. I had to. T I tweeted at her and I was like, "Fam, wind your neck in, yeah, because it's not that deep. Every people are still referring to people as women. People are still misgendering people because of you know they're assuming other people's genders and calling them women without checking with them first. And I know that I'm bad for that. I I tend to not check for people's pronouns, and I'm trying to be better at checking at how people identify. So. What are you struggling with? Nobody's out here not calling you a woman because most places are calling you a woman. So what is your problem? Then she goes um, that it's because in the tweet that they wrote about prostate cancer, they said something like um, uh, something research has been done into prostate cancer that could benefit some men. Okay, she was like, why didn't they just say could benefit people with prostates in that tweet? And I'm like, but fam, for the fact that they use the word some, they know that it doesn't apply to all men. So again, it's like you're showing me that you're the class fool, that like you're the class dunce. Like there's something really, really wrong with you. Like your you're, you're, you're two plus two is never equaling four. What the, fu what the fuck is wrong with you? And... People are voting these people into parliament. Like you're this red car, red car, my G's. Like take this girl off your roster of MPs or whatever the fuck. Get her out. She's useless. Anna Turley is useless because she's saying very, very dumb things that show me that she's dumb about other things as well. Like she's ridiculous about other things as well. And so she shouldn't have the space or the seat that she currently has because she doesn't know how to think correctly. She doesn't know how to th think and feel like an empathetic human being. So she shouldn't be where she is. And the fact that my girl is wrong and strong as well. She's tweeting at bare people who are trying to tell her like, fam, this is why they said that. And she's like, but I just feel like, it doesn't matter what you feel like go go and feel like seasoning your fucking food how about that go and feel like doing your job as a fucking mp how about that go and do that go and feel like getting a good hairdresser to really spruce up your hair because it's looking mighty dead go and do other things other than what you are doing right now rather than trying to ostracize other people other genders from certain narratives because what how you're moving you're moving like a dry pussy gal that's what you're doing so get out that's all I wanted to say about Anna, that Anna is clearly just doing the most with the absolute least and I'm not feeling it. So that was my first So You Mad. My second So You Mad is about Louis Smith. Louis Smith is an Olympic gymnast. Yes, he's an Olympic gymnast. Anyway, he was on a first class train, on a, on a virgin train. Um, we don't know where he was headed. He was sitting in first class on a virgin train and the following happened. I'm just going to read you what he tweeted. So Louis said, 
Well, this train journey certainly got a lot more interesting and political. The man serving tea and coffee is working his way down the first class carriage when he serves the man next to me, randomly asks for his ticket to prove he's in first class. He then serves the lady behind um, me to where he... um, He then serves the lady uh, behind me... um, And he just goes back to serving coffee, tea and coffee. When he gets to me, he asks if I want anything. I decline. And then he asks if I've got a first class ticket. And I said, yes. He said, can I see it? And I said, yes, but don't you believe me? And he go, and so I show him and he accepts it and carries on serving. The next three to four people he serves tea and coffee to, um, This I'm sorry I'm just trying to uh, Break down Louis's tweet, uh, tweet Because you know All the gymnastics That he's been doing He's really jumbled These words As if they're On the balancing beam With him Anyway basically He's trying to say here That he notices That the next Three to four people That this man Serves tea and coffee to Weren't asked to show Their tickets He doesn't ask anyone else If they're supposed To be in first class Or to show proof Of a ticket While the gentleman Kindly asks Why that is And the waiter says It's my choice Who I ask while the quite upset and understandably intrigued gentleman asks why he's only chosen to ask the two black passengers um, if they are meant to be in first class and to prove it. Yikes. This escalated quickly. Is it just a coincidence or a coincidence or not? What do you think? Now, I don't really like that Louis put at the end, is this a coincidence coincidence or not? What do you think? Because you know that you know that people love to move mad. People love to move mad. People love to move so mad. They're going to start trying to do the same gymnastics that you're doing. They're going to try and get an Olympic gold medal for doing the mental gymnastics to tell you how it was a coincidence that my guy only asked the two black passengers on that train and he did not ask anybody else in first class if they had a ticket to be where they were. Um, But okay, I will say that when I looked at the comments, when people were responding to him, the majority of people had the common sense to be like, nah, that's mad. And a lot of um, brown and black people also tweeted their experiences as well, that similar things have happened to them when they've been in first class, not just on a train, but when they've been in first class on a plane or in an executive lounge somewhere, someone will come and fast themselves up to ask them whether they, whether they're meant to be there. And it's those kind of things that people fail to understand are still parts of racism. Just because no one's calling you nigga, 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 doesn't mean that they're not, you're still not being subjected to racism. So I'm always a bit, my heart always does a bit of a goo-goo-goo when people are like, oh, I'm black and I've never experienced racism because I'm just like, that's literally impossible. Maybe you've never experienced something direct to you, but just by existing in this system, you've experienced it. But I'm not going to tell you about your lived experience because I know that you, man, that love to say that you've never experienced it, start getting hot under the colour and wanting to justify that it's never happened to you. So whatever you say is the truth. I'm not going to argue with you. But I just feel like as a human being with all of my cognitive senses intact... That's not possible, but okay. So anyway, he says to people, what do they think? And a lot of people give um, talk about their experiences. Um, what I like is that the other black guy, because Louis, Louis seems to be just like um, the narrator or the pundit in this situation, kind of like sitting back and letting the other black man do all of the work. Um, but that's a bit unfair because Louis is tweeting about it. So he is getting more coverage about it with his following. So fair enough. But anyway, he goes, um, the other black man, He's wanting to see the train manager. He's very calm, but clearly annoyed. And I think that that's good that he also mentioned very calm because people would love to instantly assume that the man is irate or angry because he's a black man. So I like that Louis also insisted and really pointed out that now the guy the guy is very calm, but clearly annoyed. And also it's a, it's embarrassment and humiliation. Like you're, you're singling us out to sh- to prove that because of our skin or our heritage we do not deserve to be in this place that's how you feel about it fam why don't you just serve your fucking tea and coffees like you were paid to do nobody asked you to do all the extra shit that you're doing focus on your job and face your fucking front literally face your front and push your trolley you dickhead sorry again that, an outburst so louis says 
So the gentleman just went and spoke to the train manager aboard this Virgin train and the manager said it was wrong and apologised for the man's behaviour and to tweet and complain. The waiter isn't allowed to check tickets anyway, but can ask if you're seated in first class. And this is this this is what I'm saying. It's not even in your job description, you you useless person, you vile, useless person. It's not even in your job description to check people's tickets. You can ask them if they're meant to be seated in first class, just in case people didn't realise it was first class, fine. But you now ask them to prove it and show you a ticket. Why are you going so far? If I've said I'm meant to be here, but I'm meant to be here, why do I have to show you a ticket? Because all them other men didn't have to show you a ticket. And this is why I'm always saying that white people are allowed to move mad so often and they get away with so much so often because people automatically assume that they're meant to be in the places that they're in. It's the rest of us that have to prove the fact that we're meant to be there in the first place or we were allowed to be there in the first place. It really, it really pisses me off. Anyway, Virgin Trains tweeted and they said, um, Hi, Louis. Please accept my sincerest apologies for this. I've spoken to the train manager on this service at length about what has happened and there will be a complaint logged and investigated. I hope something is done. And I'm not usually an advocate for people losing their jobs, but I want this fool, this prick to lose their job because I'm so tired of being second guessed. And this is what I'm just talking about, this whole imposter syndrome thing. We... It's no shock to me that black people and um, other minorities, minorities in inverted commas, because we are the majority, duh, um, that they feel this imposter syndrome because oftentimes whenever they enter spaces that are predominantly white, people start asking them things like, oh, are you sure you're meant to be here? And this is also what I feel about places like Frank's Bar. You go to places in Peckham that are for the Pecknamians. Well, Frank's Bar is not for the Pecknamians, but Peckham is for the Pecknamians as far as I'm concerned. And then you've got all these, this sea of white people who are looking at you like you are somewhere that you do not belong. It really, really bothers me. It bothers me that a group can claim that they're doing, I don't know, a Peckham Festival and then feel some type of way about involving me, a black business, in the Peckham Festival. That's just shade on the side, but we'll see how that goes anyway. Also remember that Jamelia, a black woman, was with, a, I said a Jamelia, a black woman, but I'm trying to remind you in case you don't know, Jamelia's a black woman. She's um, a singer, an actress, an all-round superstar. I don't know what it is. Eh, 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 oh, eh, oh, hey. Some kind of superstar, baby, baby. Oh, yeah, anyway. Um... Jamelia is a baby girl um, who has baby girls. Like she's got wonderful children. Um, she was with her daughter. I, um, I remember on a Virgin train again. And this time it wasn't um, staff that approached her. It was one white woman that fasted herself up, saw Jamelia sitting with her daughter in first class and came to ask her, oh, um, do you know where you're sitting? She was like, yeah, I know where I'm sitting. And she's like, oh, because this is first class. Yeah, bitch, I know. Oh, I'm just checking that you know that this is first. Yeah, I I know. Oh, so when Jamelia's like, why would you tell me out of everybody wh uh, that this is first class? As if, did you go and ask anybody else? Why is it me specifically that you're reminding that I'm in first class as if I'm not meant to be here? And then a white man gets on soon after. This same white lady doesn't jump out of her seat to go and check if the if the if the white man r realizes that he's in first class, if he like th th whether he's meant to be there or not. And I'm just like all of this energy, all of this concentration that you have, you could put it to so much more use. You could put it to, to towards moisturizing your entire body daily, but you don't. And that's why bare of you man are walking around in Birkenstocks and your heel back is dry as fuck. You don't go and cream your back, the, the bottom of your foot. You don't go and cream your foot bottom. You don't use your energy to do them things there. You're using your energy to police black people in spaces that you feel like they shouldn't be in. Mind your fucking business and go and cream your feet. How about that? How about that? So that was basically what I had to say about that situation. Um, Virgin needs to do more to train their staff. And I know that they can't train their passengers, but definitely train your staff to mind their fucking business and to not be so overtly racist. Because I know to ask them to just not be racist would be a, a stretch, would be a reach. Just don't be so overtly racist. Anyway, um, moving on from there, that was my So You Mad. Um, my um, straw of the week. So that's where we're going. Oh, 
No, I've got a letter from Aziza. Yeah, let's do the letter from Aziza. Let's do the letter from Aziza first before we go to my straw of the week. So my letter from Aziza, Aziza Makame is um, a blogger and she's so beautiful. I love her Instagram page, liking all of her pictures because she's so buff and she's just a lovely gal. Um, so Aziza wrote in and she said, Hi, Kelechi. I'm super excited for my first write into um, SYM pod. I've been an avid listener for a while and absolutely love the podcast and you as a person. Thank you, babe. She says, I'd firstly like to start off with a thank you. Thank you for what you're doing, um, for what you're doing with these podcasts. They mean a lot to some of us and give us strength and w- and the will to live our best baby girl and baby boy lives. Thank you for gracing my timeline, Instagram and Twitter mainly, and stories and bringing a smile to my face. Finally, thank you for being so strong in the face of adversity, for being strong in the face of fuckeries, even though you admit not to be as strong as we all think you are when we say this. I hope God blesses you and opens doors, windows, and a whole damn house for you in your future. Boop, boop. Amen. Thank you, Aziza. Um, Tuesdays are a day I look forward to, and I usually listen to SYM on my commute on these days whilst giggling on the tube. I don't know if SoundCloud tells you where your listeners are listening from, but you may have, you may find you have listeners in Japan. That was me. LOL. Um, I've been recently on a holiday to Japan as my boyfriend took me for a a graduation trip. Now, as you know, I'm a blogger on Instagram, though I never post my relationship on my page. Occasionally, just the story of me and him here and there. I've been in a relationship with a guy I've known for nearly five years now through our official, though our official relationship is closer to two years. When you're in a relationship with someone versus a friendship, it's much harder to detach yourself from how they feel uh, uh, with certain issues, issues such as race in big capital letters. My partner is an Asian man from Hong Kong. And though I love him very much, I realize not everyone is as vocal as me. He isn't and takes to calling me a social justice warrior. I view the world's problems as my own. My mother is an Arab woman and my father is a black man who is African. So I've grown up in a problematic household where my mum would say things like, why is your hair looking crazy? Crazy just being her way of describing black hair far from her own hair, which was different from her mixed kids that uh, she chose to have with a black man. So I've learned to check them, both both my parents and and with my a six year old sister, I and my other siblings do not allow um, any of this without raising a dispute and making them see their wrongs. This is why I always use the term people of color very carefully or prefer to not use it at all. Same as these are same there. I said it especially dating a man who is also deemed a person of color. I realized how internally racist and and confrontational the Asian community really is whilst being with him. Now, don't get me wrong. So many Asians, East Asians in this case, people are now slowly starting to question their racism towards black people. This is spearheaded by some amazing Asian activists I follow online. And I can honestly say what they do, what they do is bits good on them. The complicity due to their wanted and yearned proximity to whiteness is sickening. Whilst in Japan, I was reminded of that every day. People walking around with parasols, not wanting to get dark, whitening creams, adverts displaying white people all over and the weird stares I got regularly from the members of the public. At Beijing airport, all black people got patted down and searched and they took our portable chargers whilst on the way um, whilst on the way. And whilst on the way back, I asked the white girl if hers was taken and her answer was no. My partner watched it happen to me and said it was the procedure. As a black person, you question yourself over incidents and don't want to be reaching. I've learned this behavior has to stop. If it walks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, it's a motherfucking duck. I didn't let that deter me from having a good time, though. My partner was totally oblivious and thought men were staring for other reasons. That was until... We spent nights at hotels and one lovely hotel in a remote area with several hot springs. Now, when you're traveling whilst black, you take extra precautions to how people receive you. Luckily to say, uh, lucky to say this first hotel was just so warm and welcoming. The lovely hospitality of the Japanese, um, of Japanese that white people also ramble on about. I can truly have the same energy about traveling there to this particular place. There were three private baths, a mixed bath and ladies and men separate. We used all of the baths as per the the rules of being naked in each one from the mixed and everything was fine 
I ha- actually didn't use the women's one since I'd have to go by myself and my partner wouldn't be there. It made me a little uncomfortable every time he wasn't around because I always noticed that was when people started moving mad. The second hotel only had a segregated bath. So since we were paying, I thought I wouldn't waste an opportunity. And I went up with my boyfriend before we split into the respective hot springs. As I got into the hot spring, there were two women in there. They immediately started talking and left. Obviously, I don't know Chinese, which is what they were talking. And I know so... um, And I know, so since I can tell the difference in the languages, having been with my boyfriend and my university friends, they were very different. And and when spoken, you can always tell. This is something I check my parents for since in Africa, most places and most places, they just lump all Asian people as Chinese. It's annoying, disrespectful and rude as fuck. Anyway, I noticed that all of the women started waiting outside the bath or went to the sauna and the cold water pool, literally waiting for me to leave. They'd come in, look, see me, then leave. I stayed for 15 minutes. I mean, I've never really had racist experiences, but I always don't mind when people are just inconveniencing themselves. After waiting so long, I started to get really hot. You're meant to leave the pool, cool off and return. As I got out, they all rushed into the pool, about seven or eight people. I can't tell you how much my heart broke to be made to feel like your skin colour is dirty. No one would get in, um, get in um, not a smile from them, nothing. When I was going back uh, down, I saw my partner and he said to me, oh, hey, that was quick. Why are you back? I was so sad. I was like, oh, I just didn't want to stay too long. Then he said, yeah, me neither. The men's pool was so full. This is where I told him. Well, so was the women's, but I had it all to myself. He looked perplexed. I explained what had happened and tried not to cry. He just replied with, they're small minded people. They don't know better. Now, when I have these conversations about race, his arguments about Asia and how the courts are isolated, um, but the same bullshit is now in the age of information. They love black culture. They know Beyonce, all of the actors and prominent black people. Heck, in North Korea, people even know Dennis Rod and Rodman. I saw Japanese people with dreadlocks. They found ways to get afros and some even deep tan their skin to look black. There's a small amount of these um, that want to be, there's a small amount of these want to be black Japanese, but um, hey, they exist. They are racist against black people and no one does anything about it there. They always have excuses and talking to my partner is literally oppression Olympics since as a person of colour, he thinks Asian people have it bad too, which is a lie. I'm a blogger on all blogger pages. There are white girls and token Asian girls. None of those girls bat their eyelids at the fact that there's no diversity as long as they're included as far as whiteness and their proximity to it is concerned. They're included and that's why I don't really think they're people of colour. Um, A lot of white companies look towards Asia for jobs, businesses, fashion, even now They can successfully market towards this audience and the near questions um, And no one questions much When cultural appropriation happens of their garb, kimonos, uh, chengsam um, etc. They f- they're the first to say it's not appropriation if a white person does it. But lo and behold, if a black girl puts up and puts it on, suddenly it's cultural appropriation. The reason I don't put my relationship up on social media because black women and other people of color are quick to make your relationship make you relationship goals, and soon you'll find yourself making a YouTube channel for clout. Lol. A lot of men who aren't black men um, want relationships with black women without knowing what comes with it. I will continue to work with my partner. I told him racism isn't someone calling me a nigger. It's evolved. He needs to recognize and realize it. Since since then, he's working on it working on it, knowing it, um, knowing that if another incident happens and when I'm left feeling uh, my spirit is broken, I will leave him. We get so many stares and trust me, it's never from black people. It's not from, it's not the first time. And it pains me to see that other people of color can live in these bubbles and never stand up against oppressors who oppress us all. And I've made them feel, also feel the need to do things that quite frankly, wouldn't, they wouldn't be doing if it weren't for the media indoctrination. Um, how can the world, um, and then um, Aziza attached a story about a Taiwanese school um, that sparked outrage about not hiring black dark skin teachers. And Aziza goes on to say, how can the world move on when everyone hates black people? I know that was long. My partner felt so bad. He didn't want us to go back to Asia since he's afraid that it will happen um, in his home when he go- when we go. I told him 
what they want is for black people to be invisible. I say we learn their languages, we travel, we teach their youth, we become visible. We need to stop letting white people run the narrative. Thank you so much for sending that through, Aziza. Like, I greatly, greatly appreciate it. It was a lot to take in. And I definitely, I'm sending you lots of love because I'm so sorry that you had to experience that. I've been on holiday so many times and felt so, so lonely, especially when I've tried to explain to my white partner why something hurts and it's offensive when people do it. But ultimately, I find that people who are white or um, non-black people of color who have a closer proximity to whiteness, um, they just don't see certain things. And it's even more difficult when you're talking to people who don't feel that they get the benefits of whiteness. Um, so other um, non-black people of color, for instance, they've also had their struggles, definitely colonization and, um, and all of them things there, like in, indentured servitude, all of those things. But they fail to understand like the level that um, those of the African diaspora had to endure. Those were wild. Those were absolutely wild and continue even until today. And that's why a, another person of color can look at a black person and be like, Ugh, thank fuck I'm not black, even though they want all of the cultural signifiers that pertain to blackness. They just don't want the struggles that come with that blackness. But when you they don't want to see all of that as far as they're concerned oh well we we all struggled together we had it bad too yeah but look at how you're portrayed in the media now if there's ever a japanese person they're portrayed as like being super smart east asian people are portrayed as being super smart i know that also that holds a lot of east asian people down as well and south asian people it holds them into a narrative that they can't escape from but it makes them the model minority when you're the model minority as annoying as it might be you still are afforded certain benefits that aren't afforded to other people and i'm just going to say this point blank period aziza your man needs to pattern the fuck up he needs to he needs to wake the fuck up because you can't just it's not enough to just be coming out here in these streets and enjoying black pussy and then not putting the work in to support the people that you're with like support the women that you're with don't just enjoy what it means to be with a black woman like oh it's so exotic oh no I don't care about her skin I love her for who she is well if you loved her for who she is you'd understand that she's someone that's been targeted by society for merely the color of her skin, the kink in her hair, all of these things, her features, anything that put, uh, that signifies her blackness, she's been vilified for it. So if you love her for who she is, understand that this is also part of who she is and, and help her support her, like see her and see the struggle. And you've got to... Look, if you're going to date outside of your race, especially if you're going to date a black woman, you need to start using your outside voice when you're inside. If you see anyone moving mad, moving wild to your partner, you've got to be ready to speak the fuck up because all of you man want to be like, oh, I want to date black women. I want to date black women. When it's time to stand up for black women, your voice is lost. You don't know how to use your throat. It's eh, 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 eh. But everything else you want to be enjoying. Fuck that. There's a responsibility. There is a duty that comes from, that comes with being with black people and you need to get yourself ready you need to get yourself in shape like you've been with him for what you said five years five years actually I can relate to that because I've been with my partner for five years and I guess they're discovering every day because they get to walk around as men um with certain privileges and they're just like wow oh my god I didn't realize that you had to go through that as non-black people they can walk around and go oh, wow I didn't know that you had to go through that and you're just like yes I do have to go through that and if you want to remain in a relationship with me you've got to wake the fuck up and understand that this is what I do have to go through and it's either you support me or you pack your load and you come and be going and that's the level that you've really got to get to get to with some people there is an abundance of love out there. There are an abundance of souls that will see and appreciate your soul. So it's not by force to stay with someone who refuses to see your struggle. It's not because you need them to be as vigilant as you are because they need to, they need to spot things as well. So for your protection, for your safety and for your sanity, not every time will you be saying, oh, this happened to me. And they're like, uh, really? Oh yeah. You know, they're just small minded people. Oh, you know, there's just some ignorant people out there. 
I feel like the issue with your partner is that he hasn't even begun to understand the gravity of what you go through as a black woman because he's still trying to say, oh, but you know, I've I I I'm coming to I'm coming to it from an equal level as well. We're not, we're not, we're not, we're, we're not at different, we're not at the same level or of anything. We're not. Sometimes we're not even in the same arena. So you can drop that for one. And for, I feel like he's avoiding very real conversations that need to be had with his family, wherever they are, wherever, wherever they are in the world he's avoiding having that conversation by going oh we don't need to go back to these places no we do need to go back and you need to speak up you he specifically needs to speak up i know that you're talking aziza about the fact that we need to learn their languages we need to do this we need to do that but not every time us you know not every time us give because tony morrison dunn said that like the very real function of racism is distraction there are so many other things that i need to learn and do me learning your languages and doing your things to to learn about you it's not my priority you all watch TV from when you know um, Beyonce and you know Dennis Rodman and you know all of them things there. You can also use the same TV, the same internet to learn about the things that you need to learn about. Give your partner a um, Rennie Edo Lodge's book, Why I'm No Longer Talking to Black People About Race and Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race. Get him to read that and start to teach himself because you, you can't be spending time, valuable time that you could be spent using to be a baby girl. You're spending it trying to get him in, in line. There's life is too short life is too short as much as you may love him life is too fucking short so he needs to either like i said pattern the fuck up or he should just start start going start going because nobody's got time nobody's got time you're a wonderful person a beautiful person that he needs to stand up for and stand up with yeah so that's all i've got to say about that um and just uh for my straw of the week My straw of the week goes out to my Uber driver Who um, last week when I was off to get my tattoo to, commem to commemorate my miscarriage I was in his car And he started forcing conversation with me His name was Mohammed. He was forcing conversation with me And he was like Oh I bet you look like You, you must be Nigerian Because I think he's Somali He was like you must be Nigerian I said yes Um I'm Nigerian. Oh, Yoruba. I said half Yoruba, half Igbo. Oh, where's your dad from? He's Igbo. So you're Igbo then. And I fucking hate when people do that because two fucking people gave birth to me. So don't be telling me about, oh, um, you're, you're, you're this because your father's from there. I'm wherever the fuck I say I'm from. You will not tell me otherwise. Anyway, so he's saying all of this and he's like, oh, but I bet you look like your mum. I was like, ha ha. Uh, okay. He goes, yeah, you must look like your mum because when you want a child to look like you, um, the woman's waters have to be released first before the man's sperm goes in. So your mum orgasmed first before your dad and that's why... Um, before your dad orgasmed And that's why you look more like your mum We, re we uh, remember this from ancient cultures Because these are the things that we forgot When the white people came I was like, her? First of all I don't know for your pseudoscience But also I don't know you Why are you trying to tell me about my mum's sex life? Why are you trying to tell me about my mum orgasming? Like fam, who told you that I want an image Of my mum having an orgasm? Are you fucking mad? Stop talking So I just avert the conversation And I'm just like, oh, we're finally on Blackfriars Bridge Because all of these times he's taking wrong turns Because all they do is follow Waze Or um, Google Maps or whatever So he doesn't actually know where he's going Um so finally we get onto Blackfriars Bridge Because we're heading towards Ca uh, Caledonian Road Because I'm going to go and see Lord Montana Blue To get my tattoo um, And he, no, he he forces it Tries to go back there He's like, oh So when if you want a child that looks like you Make sure that you orgasm first Before your partner Tell your partner Let me, let me come first And then your child will look like you I was so kind of unnerved I was like, what? Huh? Why? Stop. So I just said, mm -hmm. really not engaging in conversation with him, giving him all the social cues that I'm not having this conversation with him. Anyway, you know, the best time to conceive for a child between five and nine days after your period. This is when we believe a woman is clean as a Muslim. This is what we believe. Stop. It got to the point where I just started dialing. You know when you're just dialing a number, any number To just be on the phone with anybody To avoid having any further conversation with this person And I called my partner and I was just on the phone to him Just to avoid talking to this guy You could see that he was disappointed And he kept looking behind to see if I was coming off the phone anytime soon Like proper looking at me like 
Like, when am I coming off the phone? Because he wants to carry on his dead conversation. Anyway, I had to report it because it made me so uncomfortable. I reported it to Uber. They refunded my money, which I think is just the least they could do. They should do way more than that, but whatever. And they said that they're investigating this guy. And I was proper conflicted because I don't want to be putting um, an, a, another black person in a situation where they might lose their job or whatever. But you can't force conversations like that with people. It's, it's just uncomfortable. What the fuck? What the fuck? I want Uber to imp, um, to, to, to create an, a part of their profile where you can just click that you don't want the driver to have any conversations with you other than where are you going to, co to confirm where you're going and that's it. Don't chat to me because every time Uber drivers go and they say more than five words, it always goes left. I've only had like two decent conversations in all my years of taking Uber. I don't want any more. I don't want them to talk to me, especially not like that. That was... That was disgusting. That was absolutely disgusting. It was vile and just yuck. Yuck. So my straw goes out to Mohammed, not the not our prophet, peace be on to him. No, this particular guy, my straw goes out to this Uber driver for his wild, wild behavior. Suck your mum and wench your orgasms. That's what you should do. That's exactly what I want you to do. That's all because it's it's just disgusting. Yuck. Anyway, that's it for this week. This episode of SYMs done. I've been Kalechi Okafor, and this has been SYM, officially known as Say Your Mind, and unofficially known as What What. That's right. Suck your mom. Whew. Yeah. So you can follow me on at Say Your Mind Pod or at Kalechnikov. And I'll add some links for Baba Seki's Wives, for the book stem, all of the things that you need to get your life. And I will be seeing you soon. Peace. It's the Ben's Brunani woman is baby boys, baby girls, you need to hear this. Baby, sit down, sit down, receive this realness. Make sure your cup's ready for the tea, we are go sip it, yo. Hard time scrolling for your long truths. You might learn something you never know. Collect you find, and she's one of a kind. Don't say you mind, say you mind.